Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Come with me as we step into the deep, dark forest of fear. And let us pray that we see sunrise in the morning. Tonight's show is two chapters in the incredible series, The Scariest Thing in the Woods. As ever, please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought. Please do like and share and don't forget to hashtag Team Fear and help build this community and channel. Big, big welcome to all of you brand new subscribers. I hope you enjoyed the channel as it is so far and everything that I produce. Do take a time to check out the playlist section where you'll find things a bit more organised in terms of what's the true encounters, uh, the true subscriber stories and then the fictional work as well. But without further ado, let's get into tonight's story entitled The Scariest Thing in the Woods Chapter 9 Let's get straight into that I have said I was built for the cold but up here it is so cold it jars you down to your bones we are moving at a good clip though. I estimate that we are only a few miles from our quarry. The unique thing is our party seems to have grown by one. The Wahila is flanking us, about a hundred yards out. I normally understand the behaviour of wolves, but not this time. I don't know if he's just interested in the upcoming fight, or he plans on joining it. And if he does, which side? I want to finish this as fast as possible. I check my weapons. They have not frozen up, which is good. I have a clip left with the explosive copper rounds, but that works only sometimes. I hope Tom was able to have them fabricated professionally. What a bonus they would be in the upcoming fight. Who am I kidding? What a bonus they would be in this fight. I think about that poor Mountie that was killed. How easily that creature run up and hit him, and then just devoured him. To be honest, I or Tony are not very keen on finding out either. Now I think that my quarry is closer. Now maybe at the top of that rise I'll be able to sight it and get a shot. I pray that I can end this fight in one shot. At the top of the snow covered rise I see my target moving towards Fort Reliance. I adjust the distance right at a thousand yards. I set up to fire. The first shot missed though barely. It strikes the bank just to its left. The creature stops turns towards us and lets out a large roar and starts then towards us. I ease and let out my breath and then squeeze the trigger. Another miss, but close. I curse my luck and wonder if it's the cold or these rounds that have my aim off. I look through my scope at it, about 900 yards off now. This thing is easily the most grotesque thing I've ever seen, and that's saying something. It's about 10 feet tall, loose fitting shaggy white it looks like the skin is just hanging off it. It doesn't have a face and it's just kind of like an elk skull with tattered flesh and horns. It looks at us with glowing red eyes. I reset my scope dials and zero in. 800 yards out. My third shot is not only a hit, but it actually explodes. And its shoulder looks torn up pretty bad. Two special rounds left. As I eject the last round, it's 700 yards out. I take in a breath. Hold it. Sight my mark. A sound squeeze and the sound of the man-made thunder echoes over the snow as this round hits perfectly in the middle of his chest area. There is no explosion this time but the shot drops him to his knees. He's not dead, only hurt, but I know I have him. No close combat this time. I'm going to put the fifth and the last special round in his throat below his jaw. Even if it doesn't explode, it should finish this fight. He hasn't moved anymore. He's just kneeling out there. I lock in the round and take a breath. Sight my target. Again, Xiao squeeze and again the man made thunder. But the effects are about as far as what I wanted. It jams. The flash was ungodly and the pain searing as the experimental round explodes in the chamber. If I hadn't been wearing a mask and safety glasses, I wouldn't have a face left. I recover in a few minutes. I'm hurt, but nothing that will stop me. I will heal providing I have the chance to. My eyes clear when I see the Wendigo. He has also recovered and is only a few hundred 
yards out. Right now my 308 is trash now. I could have at least put a few regular rounds in it. It's amazing how only a couple of drops of quicksilver can hurt so much. I have got to get up and now it looks like my melee is the last option. I hope it's hurt enough that we can overpower it quickly. Lou is helping me to my feet while I look at my face and Tony is looking at the destroyed firearm. My 50 cal pistol is operational. It has four AP rounds in it and I have two more cylinders. Okay, I'm back to my feet. Head's still a little wobbly. Blood is oozing from several small wounds. Let's hope I'm ready to fight. I noticed the Wahila about a hundred feet away, but Tony and Lou are right next to me. Well, for better or worse, it's about time to end this, one way or another. I allow my primal forces to move through me. I feel my strength returning. Okay, guys, let's get ready to end this thing. A hundred feet away, this red-eyed monstrosity roars his challenge. I pull my revolver. Time to see this monstrosity, for who is the scariest thing in the woods? I know this 50 cal s and w will put this thing down, so let's get into this fight. I want to kill this thing or find some place warm. Well, if this thing was waiting for me to make a mistake, it waited long enough. And this time of year, this high up only has about five hours of daylight and the sun is going down. It's moving off behind the snow dune and into the sparse forest and of course, we follow. Not only does the sun go down, but it goes down fast. I can't believe I got so involved in this kill that I lost track of time. Now, the Wendigo has an advantage. It's about dark 30. I switch to my night vision goggles. Tony and Lou are hanging close. No sign of the Wahila. I admit, I still don't know if that's a good thing or not. I hear a voice. That's very familiar. You are a disappointment to this family. You make me sick to my stomach. You ungrateful cur. Get out of my sight now! That's my father's voice. The day he disowned me. I know this creature can mess with my head. Lou, come here, boy. Come. That's Bill's voice. Lou, stay with me. Don't listen. I yell out, monster. It won't work. Face me now. It's time for you to die. No, Mr. Johnson. I think not. But maybe yours. The Marine Corp Colonel voices in my head. I'm told to drop my weapons and stand down. No, you will not fool me. That way I know it's you, monster. I yell out. Lou, track this thing. We start moving around the scrub. Lou and I have been working together for years. And Tony, well, he's fit right in in the last couple of months. We move as a unit around the snow and sparse woods. We move around the dark area looking for our prey. Lou is keen of nose and has his set. I keep hearing voices telling me this is futile. Dawn, Bill, even Michelle telling me to sleep, but it's easy to ignore the voices when you know you are alone. Lou can't talk, and I don't think Tony can. At least I hope not. I see it in the shadows. My night vision goggles detect something ahead, something big, and I'm sure it's him. I allowed myself to make one mistake today. I will not make another. I tell Tony and Lou to shh as I move closer. I see the red eyes. As it turns on me, my 50 cal handgun erupts, breaking the silence. The thing doubles over, and then Tony rushes in to attack. Tony and the Wendigo are in a stand-up fight. I can't fire for the fear of hitting Tony. I remember that the 45 slugs didn't penetrate his hide. But with a 50 cal AP5, I guess it's time to rock. Lou joins the fight, and I pull my blades, and it's time to get up close and personal. I debate for a second. Do I? It would be the perfect time. This thing smells rotten, but I can tell it's hurting. A heavy clawed hand connects with Tony and sends him reeling. I can't risk my friends getting hurt by this thing. I decide it's time to take control. I howl, drawing all my power into me. Muscles tighten. Remember what I said about not making another mistake. You guessed it. I drop my guard and take a massive blow to my head. I don't suffer any ill effects from it, but my MVCs do as they shatter against the frozen ground. That matters little to me as my eyes adjust quickly to the infrared spectrum. But this thing it doesn't have a heat signature. It's all cold like a snowman. I swing at it with everything I've got and miss. But not just a miss, 
I'm off balance and I catch a clawed hand in a midsection. Hard. I taste the blood in my mouth. I start to feel the blackness overshadow me. No! I can't go down! If I go down, I die. And so does Lou and possibly Tony. Curse me for a fool! All types of combat require practice. I thought I was a man for too many years. I am asleep in the cave and woken by a sweet voice. Warrior, it's time to awaken. It's dawn. Or is it the Wendigo? In my mind. I said wake up. I snap up awake. Your arrogance has cost you that battle. You were lucky to be alive with no loss of life. What were you thinking? The Ancient One told you your weapons would kill the creature, and you still wish to play with the beast? But your two minds will only get you killed. I say, Lou, uh, Tony. They live, but not because you saved them. The Wendigo wants human flesh, and right now, it is approaching to man's village, where it will feast and grow more powerful. Now arise and shake off this doubt and challenge the creature and kill it! Do you think your luck will continue? Remember... Chance favours the prepared mind. I see the little sliver of sunlight. I hear my own thoughts saying, Chance favours the prepared mind. I'm not in a cave. I'm out on the tundra. Tony and Lou are curled up next to me, sharing body heat. I notice my clothes are mostly intact. I thought to embrace my true nature last night. That was also a mistake, and one I will not make again. Chance favours the prepared mind, I say. We're up now. I take a fast inventory of my gear. My clothing and weather gear is mostly intact. MVGs and my rifle are destroyed. We have to hurry. I have to catch this thing before it reaches Fort Reliance and before dark. I check out my handgun. It's fine. I have ten rounds. We have to run, guys, I tell Tony and Lou. My speed is comparable to theirs as we head off. And while we run, I think... I remember the powers this thing has, and I have to catch it before nightfall. It will most likely invade that town in the dark, so to be able to use its full powers. I don't plan on letting it. To our left, I see the giant wolf, the Wahila, again. Is it a spy, or is it here to help? I make up my mind and I don't care. It's about noon, when we crest the hill over Fort Reliance. It will now be getting dark in less than three hours. Now. Where is this monster? I see a group of scrub spruce a couple of hundred yards away, and the Wahila is heading that direction. I'm not overthinking this time. I am a hunter, and this is my prey. I see a tundra cave, and I know my hunt is over. It's time for this thing to die. I stand at the mouth of the cave, gun in hand. Chance favours the prepared mind, I say. Tony and Lou, I shout, and they know exactly what I want as they house loud and strong, even a Wahila joins them. This is the challenge, Now, monster accept it. I hear a voice, sweet and calm. No hunter, the Wendigo will come tonight to the town. Face it there, where you are powerful. I laugh, I will not be fooled again, monster. The Wendigo rushes from the shallow cave, but I'm ready. Chance favours the prepared mind. I fire two rounds at it, at least one hits home in the creature's arm. He takes a hard swipe at me and does connect, but I'm already rolling, and for all his power, he only moves me a little faster in my roll. Tony and Lou hit him, and in a high-low style of American football, he drops like a ton of bricks. They grab his feet and pull him backwards, and he throws Lou off and grabs Tony by the throat. But I have a new cylinder in my gun now, and fire into the back of his head. He releases Tony and gets to his feet. Four more 50 cal APs hit him. He falls, but he's not out of it yet. I am changing to my last cylinder, and Tony and Lou and the Wahila savage him. I guess I know what side he's on now. I yell, guys, get away from him now! But Tony and Lou do as they're instructed. But the Wahila hasn't fought with us, so he doesn't understand the command. Those razor-sharp claws dig into his side. As I empty the revolver into the creature, I can't take time to look after the Wahila. I have to work fast. Pulling a blade, I start to work on the severing of the head. Lou is licking the Wahila as I set the head aside and start to cut on the other pieces. God, this thing stinks! Tony stops, sniffs the air and moves behind the cave as I hear a couple of snowmobiles approach. The Mounties ride up, saying they heard gunfire. One of them is First Nation young man. 
that helped at the cabin. We talked for a bit and they helped me finish dismembering the Wendigo. They are wise to the way of the spirit, so they don't question. They just help. They pause at the dying form of the Wahila, and they both start to sing a deaf song. At that point, I would not have believed it if I had not seen it with my own eyes. As the creature passed from this world to the next, its spirit's form became tangent and stepped out and into Lou. There will be no living with that wolf now. We pack the head of the Wendigo and tell the Mounties I have to bury it in a sacred place. They both understand. One tells me that I am welcome with the Inuits, but my country still considers me a wanted man. I nod my head and say it matters little. I have to return. I leave and we start across the tundra to the Great Bear Lake. Time passes quickly, much more quickly than the trip out here. And when we reach the cave, there is food and warmth. We bury the head of the Wendigo and take a few days to rest and eat and get our strength back. I sleep and I dream. The Ancient One speaks to me and so does Dawn. I will not make these mistakes again. I am Jim Johnson, Hunter. I am much more than most will ever know, but only I can control my destiny. I will not be caught lacking again. I may be the scariest thing in the woods, but chance favours the prepared mind. We start back after a few days, and we cross the tundra, and we're close to Greater Slave Lake. I have no clue how long we have been out there. I wonder if we will run into that small dogman clan again. I don't have any means to hunt, so I really can't get them some camp meat. Our supplies are too short. We make camp for the nights, and both Tony and Lou's ears perk up. I sense it too. We are not alone, but I don't feel any malice. The next thing we see are the yellow eyes. I think the clan found us. Two of the members come into the firelight, and Tony immediately raises to his full height, and both dogmen show up submission to him. And he looks at me, and then disappears into the nights with them. Lou and I settle down for the rest of the night, letting Tony go party with his kind. The next morning, the sun isn't up yet, and will not be until quite some time. Tony is back with his new friends. He walks up to me and raises to his full height, which is close to nine feet now. Remember earlier, I had said Tony wouldn't get off all fours around me? Well, unless he's going into a fight. Now, he's on two legs and staring right into my eyes. A different challenge. He lets out a growl and bares his teeth. Lou is up in a minute to accept the challenge. Easy boy, easy, I tell Lou. What's on your mind, Tony? Tony snarls. I understand now. I put my hands out in a submissive posture. He howls and turns to leave with his new pack. Talk about corny. All I can think is my little boy has grown up. Before he leaves, he looks back at me. I can see the expression in his eyes. I smile. Good luck, Tony. Lead your pack well. And remember, Yellowstone will always be your home. Okay, time to take stock of what I have. I am somewhere just north of Whitmore Wilderness Park. I'm guessing that's where the pack that Tony is now leading lives. That would put Edmonton on my left and Calgary south. I have no hunting rifle, no rounds for my 50 cow S and W, and only a few days rations left for Lou and I. I hope we can scrounge up some small game. I'm about 500 miles out. If Lou and I can run, we can make it in less than 10 days. I'm glad I have speed and stamina comparable to Lou, but this cold weather and scarce rations will hurt both of us if we run. I'm not even sure what month it is. I could risk going into Calgary, but with no money. And being a wanted man, I don't think that would avail me much. Talk about a rock and a hard place. All right, boy. Let's run. We run for the better part of the day along Jasper National Forest, and we're on the outskirts of Calgary. Chance favours the prepared mind. I keep telling myself. But an empty belly and being tired tends to make your mind not so prepared. We manage to find a little rocky outcrop and take shelter. We awake the morning of the fourth day. This is it for our provisions. Lou and I eat what little we have left. We are near Clarksville and Canada Highway too. This is where we entered Canada. It turns into USBS at the border. We will have to miss the checkpoint like when we entered. What are the chances of that truck still being there? We top a hill and there's a small farm in the valley. Looks like a Norman Rockwell painting. Frame house barn, all snow covered, peaceful. 
There is a man in the yard. Looks like he's waiting for someone or something. Lou and I approach. Yee-hee! Warrior, the man says, waving his hand. I only know this is a greeting. He then tells us not to worry. He speaks American, and I laugh. This man offers us a meal and a bed. It seems that this man is a shaman of the Inuit people, and he was told we might be heading this direction. Lou and I graciously accept. We eat our fill and sleep in a barn. The next morning, Sam, the only name I was given, drives us to within a mile of the US border. Lou and I thank him and start to leave. He says, what you did for my people is more than you can be repaid for. He then wishes us luck. A few miles down and we cross into Montana. I was right though, that truck is no longer there. But Lou started to sniff around and dig. I have actually never seen him do this. What is it boy? What have you found? There is an ammo box wrapped in a jacket. Smart, I say. I open a box and there is a letter from Tom. He tells me if I find this, I need to try and contact him. And there is a number and $200 in the box. Also that Bill was talking to people to try and get me unwanted. Okay, I have no phone, but at least I know this area. It's mid-January and colder than I care to be out in. Very few weapons and only a few provisions now, but I have money. But how do I get a phone to use? The nearest town is Bab, just north of St. Mary Lake. The nearest friendly face I can think of is the Martin family in Bozeman. But I don't want them to get involved. A few more days travelling south, and chance favours the prepared mind. I run across a family in distress. Nothing serious, just a stuck vehicle. I help them out, and they offer me a ride. I decline, but they allow me to use their phone. Tom answers the phone, and two hours later, he picks Lou and me up. My God, is it good to be home. Tom had managed to get a hold of my footlocker. So now at least I have my 30-30 law and my 45 and my 9mm, along with a solid supply of ammunition. Tom also hands me a couple of boxes of 308 rounds copper tips. I tell Tom that I no longer have my 308s, along with the story of how I lost it. There is also clean clothes and my shaving kit. I need and want to clean up, Tom. Tom, where are we headed? I ask. To Martin Farm, outside Bosman, he says. Tom, we shouldn't involve them. If I am caught and convicted, especially in Texas, they, you and them will all be charged with aiding a convicted murderer. That can carry a very harsh sentence. They and I are not concerned with that, son. They offer to help just like I did. Your friends believe in you. That college professor, Dr. Thompson, is lobbying for your charges to be dropped without sufficient evidence. I also heard the FBI team they sent after you said you could have killed them all, but you not only didn't, but helped them out of a serious jam. Ha, <laughs> yeah, they were babes in the woods, boss. No business being out there. Is it true? You skunked them? Smiling, I say, well, maybe. Lou opens his eyes and gives me an incredulous look. Smart ass wolf. And see, even your partner is telling on you. We arrive in Bosman. It's late, but the lights are on. Mrs. Martins tells me I can take a hot bath if I like. And the general consensus in the room is yes, take a bath now. I soak a long time in a hot water. I had forgot what my body being warm felt like. I think about my mother back in the day when she would bath me and tell me stories. I had a privileged life, but that life I could never live. Sometimes I miss a family's love. What am I thinking? My family is the ones that care for me. And by heaven, I will not let them down. I have finished the bath and dressed in my clean uniform. It's all I have, though I'm not a ranger any longer. Mrs. Martin takes a pair of shears to my hair and beard afterwards, and I actually look human again. The next morning, I know I have to get out of here. I can't stay anywhere too long. Tom, Lou and I load up. I say my goodbyes to the Martin family, telling them I will not forget their kindness. As Tom is driving off, he tells me I need to find a place to lay low for a while. The FBI can still show up. My place, here. They can show up anywhere, anytime, looking for you. Especially Yellowstone. I tell him then, I will hide right under their noses. I'll hide in the zone of death. Tom's face is stern. Well, that should be pretty seclusive, since no one lives there. I built a small cabin back there before I joined the Forest's service. I last checked on it a couple of years ago. Since no one is there, it stays pretty safe. 
There is plenty of game around there. I think Glue and I can hold up there. At least until we figure out the next step. Tom takes a back way into Yellowstone. It's nice to know this area well. You learn all the little nooks and crannies. The Zone of Death is a 50 mile wide stretch of land on the west side of Yellowstone border in Idaho. And it's called that because of a mix up in the law for the park. They say you could utterly get away with murder there, though all I want to do is hide. Tom gives me more provisions and a cell phone and charger. We will try to let you know if it's clear or dangerous. Though the signal back there might be non-existent, I will get in touch with y'all. I actually know where you can pick up a signal in that back area. I don't tell Tom where I'll be exactly. The less he knows about that, the safer he will be. He lets me out at the base of those mountains and wishes me luck. I smile back saying chance favours the prepared mind. I am headed for a place called Cave Falls back in this area. It is true that a few, very few tourists that will come here to see the fall will be close but will not be able to see me. But I will be able to see anyone that comes into the area without them seeing me. I track along the snow covered foothills. It's late January and there will be no one looking up here. I reach the falls and climb the mountain there. Back about a hundred yards to see the small cabin. Well boy, here we are, home at last for now. The structure is half above ground and half under. I open the door and Lou and I go in. I start a fire and fireplace and this place is very spartan. Along with the rock fireplace there is a cooking stove, a bed couple of chairs and a table. Lou jumps on the bed. I say guess again dog. He just gives me that same superior look. I said there would be no living with him now. My eyes fixed on the last fixture in the cabin and the only piece of refinement I possibly own. Part of me is glad to see it here while the other part wishes someone had found and stolen it. But like it or not, it is my past, my presence and regrettably my future. It is the reason I am the scariest thing in the woods. A young boy runs around the opulent house looking for his mother. As he sees her, he runs to her. Mama, mama! Her sweet voice. Oui, mon loup. What is wrong, little one? The child says, Mama, Papa is off in the woods with Henry. He didn't take me. He likes Henry more than me because he is older. I am just a little kid. The tall noble woman. No, mon loup. He does not care for your cousin more than you. Henry being older and now being with no parents, your father is just torturing him a little more. That is all, little one. The child screams. I am not little. I am taller than the other boys my age, and stronger, and faster, even more so than Henry. I know, little one, mon loup. But Henry is a year older than you are, and needs your father's special skills. Do not be jealous. It hardly befits your status, the future lord of this manor, the future marquis of this land. Will you not one day marry the beautiful daughter of Lord Darnie? Yes, mamma, but... I will. I'm sorry. I just wanted to go with Papa and Henry. The lady ruffles the child's hair. You will, mon loup, you will. The boy is playing with two servant children. Treat me no different, he tells them. They are good friends. They rush into the garden. It's dusk and the perfect time for adventure for young boys. As they play, a large dog rushes into the garden. Not a dog, but a wolf. The children scatter, except for the young lord. He will not run from some creature. The wolf approaches the young lord. Their eyes lock. Yellow, unblinking eyes lock on unblinking green eyes. This is a challenge of wills. One of the servant's children grabs a heavy stick and swings it at the wolf. The wolf easily dodges the stick and savages the servant child's hand. The lord steps in between them and backs the wolf up. No fear can be seen in his eyes. The wolf then tackles the young lord and playfully licks him in the face before hearing the cries from the servants coming to avenge the attack. The wolf flicks the boy one more time and seems to wink with one eye as he turns and lopes out the garden. The young lord, instead of sleeping, is prowling around his halls by his father's study as he hears his father yelling, Of all the irresponsible things to do, he has his cousin Henry. Say meekly, I am sorry, uncle. I was just showing off. Enough! I know what you were doing. Bragging to your cousin, do not underestimate him. His blood is pure, his power unmatched. Because of your actions, I had to pay that servant 20 silver coins. 
for what you did to his son, and I will also have to now employ a cripple when he becomes of age. My cousin shouts again. I'm sorry, uncle. The sounds of the beating after that are terrible. As he hears Henry whimpering, he softly says, Do not cry, my cousin, for he will only beat you harder. Mama, my cousin Henry, he turned into a wolf. I know you said being jealous is beneath me, but I want to be a wolf too. Do not worry, mon loup. Give it time, and you will be the most powerful wolf of all. I love this area of the park. In my opinion, Cave Falls is the most scenic place in all of Yellowstone, and so few know it's here because of that zone of death title this area has. The water doesn't freeze in the falls because of the hot springs, but it isn't too hot. Plenty of game here also. I spot a mule deer and one well-placed shot later, Lou and I have camp meat for at least two weeks. So, I am worried though. I am out in the open on this mountain, and if the feds still want me that bad, they are most likely trying to get a satellite reading on me. Well, hopefully, they think I'm still in Canada. Hopefully to them, it would be foolish for me to even return to Yellowstone. So I hope hiding under their respective noses is a good idea. I search the area for any signs of anything out of the norm. No people. Well, of course, not this time of year. No predators to speak of. Bears, coyotes, there are no cats either. Though, I will not rule out a puma or a lynx. I admit to myself, I don't know what the signs are for Bigfoot or Dogman. If Tony were here, he would be able to sense them. I hope he's doing okay in his new life. I admit, I do miss the old dog somewhat. Wow, fantastic stuff, Jim. Thank you so much for putting in this dedication and effort and just absolutely fantastic creative writing keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time i just hope i do the story enough justice as ever guys and girls please do let me know down below in the comments what you thought please do like and share and help build this community and channel and of course don't forget to hashtag team fear big big thank you to all of you for your wonderful wonderful comments and and emails and dms of support uh really really does help me day to day in my depression and struggles in life I hope you're all well and happy yourselves. And as ever, guys, above all, please remember, be safe, not sorry.